Okay, so this is the second part of uh, this, uh, this week nine lecture where we dive into public assistance programs and we're talking about uh, temporary assistance for needy families. That's the name of our uh, welfare uh, system today. And so uh, we're looking at history first. And so we go all the way back uh, to before the Social Security Act of 1935 and recall that uh, we had mentioned these mother's aid, mother's pension programs that were uh, at the state level, uh, that were being developed at the state level in the 1910s the 1920s. So what we did essentially in 1935, we took all the different state programs, the state mother's pension programs, and we consolidated all those programs into one program called aid dependent children. Now, when we consolidated all the different state programs, of course, there was a shift in philosophy uh, just reflected in the title of the program. It was no longer a program for uh, the moms necessarily. That was to be covered through old age survivors insurance or our social security program actually, that was the, the intent uh, behind these different uh, programs that were put into place. Uh, and so we had a program called Aid to Dependent Children, reflecting the philosophy of the program, which was to provide assistance uh, to the kids themselves. So uh, I was just talking about uh, the mothers and, uh, and the fact that we implemented a survivor's component. Recall that uh, when we talked about the social security, we added the survivor's component in 1939, with the thought that uh, we wouldn't need to administer uh, assistance to the poor through a public assistance mechanism, we could just do it through an insurance mechanism, have people contribute into the program, and if something happens to the, uh, to the main breadwinner, then we'd have a, an insurance program in place. And so when we implemented that survivor's component into our social security program, it was thought that ADC, this program for dependent kids, would simply wither away, but that certainly didn't happen. Uh, ADC grew and grew exponentially over the years uh, to now what has become a, a TANF for Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. And so we'll trace uh, very quickly and with broad brush strokes uh, the history uh, of the program. So a little note here on the financing of our welfare system over the years. Uh, so historically, uh, our welfare system has been financed through a combination of both federal uh, and state sort of uh, administration. So both the federal governments and the state governments contribute uh, to financing the system. And so that's what I'm showing here. The federal government uh, in the early years of the program would contribute 33% of costs. And so you can see, uh, I note here, the payment levels, $18 per child uh, for the first child and then $12 for each additional child. So the federal government would match that, match whatever the states were, uh, the states were spending uh, by 33%. Uh, there's a federal matching formula. And then 1962, this matching, this financing formula was uh, shifted uh, to a percentage between 50 to 80 percent of costs. And so the way that uh, most of our welfare programs have been financed over the years, uh, it's sort of an inverse, inverse formula where the richer the state, uh, the lower the federal contribution, right? So, uh, and vice versa, where the poorer the state, the greater the federal contribution to the state uh, in terms of uh, operating or administering the state welfare programs. Uh, but to get back to the theme about the growth of the program, you can see some of the numbers uh, here in terms of the growth of our welfare program. Historically, uh, we thought the ADC would simply go away uh, by uh, implementing the survivor's component of uh, Social Security that we would, uh, that we would operate uh, a program for mothers and widows through a, an insurance component, but that, of course, didn't uh, necessarily uh, result in uh, abolishing ADC, right? And so these are the numbers, 2.2 million recipients by 1950. By 1960, we have 3 million people on the welfare rolls. By 1970, over 7 million people on the welfare rolls. And so the program just keeps growing and growing. And of course, with growing welfare caseloads, there's the concern, uh, like we've pointed out over and over, about dependency on government, right? And the lack of uh, work incentive. And so to address this uh, growing concern over dependency on government, uh, our federal government passed in 1967 a major amendment. This is uh, called the Work Incentive Amendments of 1967. Uh, just a little side note, it was initially called the Work uh, or a WIP Amendment. Uh, and you can see, you can imagine what sort of a backlash that would have with potential recipients uh, calling a program uh, WIP. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the program is called the WIN Amendments. And this is uh, the very first time that we see an earnings disregard. We talked about the earnings disregard in the last half of this class, and this is where it starts. In 1967, we implement uh, a 30 and a third disregard, meaning that the first $30 of earnings is disregarded when calculating the welfare benefit, and then one third of all remaining earnings is also disregarded when calculating the benefit. And of course, the idea behind it is to promote work, get people off the welfare rolls, uh, 
as quickly as possible. So that was the intent. With the concern of growing dependency and the growing caseloads, uh, we have uh, those amendments. We have another set of amendments in 1980, uh, which, uh, which is, again, reflecting the concern over dependency despite the 1967 implementation of uh, this earnings disregard 30 in the third disregard, uh, the welfare caseloads kept on growing. And so in 1980, we were less generous. We said, well, the work, the work incentive uh, doesn't seem to be working. The earnings disregard doesn't seem to be working as well as we thought. Uh, and so that earnings disregard is scaled back. It's no longer 30 in the third disregard, but essentially a $30 disregard. And you can imagine, I'm just showing here in the next slide, uh, what the impact of that disregard change might be. Uh, and so, uh, Recall that in this context, benefit levels. So assume that in this context, benefit levels are much lower. If you have a family of three, and let's say they were earning $630, they have $630 of earnings. So prior to the 1980 amendments, this family would, uh, would have had $30 disregarded, leaving them with $600 of caliber earnings. And then they would have had 33% of all remaining earnings disregarded when calculating the AFDC benefit. And so they would have only had caliber earnings of $400. Uh, and so they would receive a net benefit of $117 from the government in, in terms of uh, their AFDC or ADC benefit. But with this disregard change, uh, when you change the disregard to only $30, this family of three now has $600 of caliber earnings, which exceeds the maximum uh, benefit that's allowable uh, during this time. And so uh, that family no longer receives the benefit. So I'm showing just a quick calculation to demonstrate the point that the net effect, the aggregate effect, uh, this disregard change was to kick people off the welfare rolls. A less generous earnings disregard will have the net benefit of making sure that we have fewer uh, recipients, in other words. So despite all these efforts, you have a series of amendments, uh, and I just pointed out two, the 1967 and 1980 amendments. We have, uh, we have a number of other amendments that were designed to reduce the uh, welfare caseloads, but that's not what happened, right? So we're getting into the 1990s and into uh, President Bill Clinton's administration and the welfare caseloads keep growing. We have upwards of 11 million individuals receiving welfare by the early 1990s. And so the states are individually, uh, they're, they're experimenting with different ways to operate uh, their welfare programs. Uh, and we're also seeing some major demographic shifts. I had pointed out before uh, shifts in the family structure. So we're seeing more and more uh, kids born outside of marriage, right, uh, close to uh, 30% by this time in the 1990s. And, uh, and the government is also noting in, in the way of demographics that most uh, welfare recipients receive welfare assistance for long periods of time. So uh, most, uh, for more than five years, in other words. And so it's the confluence of all these demographic uh, uh, factors and dependence, and once again, a concern over dependency on the government that leads uh, Clinton to enter his second term under a campaign of ending welfare as we know it. So he pledges uh, when he runs for office uh, for re-election in 1996 to end welfare as we know it. So that's exactly what he does. He comes into office in 1996 for a second term, and he passes uh, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, or what we uh, simply refer to as PERORA. Uh, insiders will just call it a PERORA. What it did was it replaced our welfare system. It replaced AFDC. Uh, that's what we had up until 1996, and then uh, replaced it with a program called TANF, or Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And so you can imagine what the philosophy is behind this program called Temporary Assistance uh, for the families. Uh, it replaces the old system, which was an entitlement program. You could receive welfare benefits as long as you needed them, right? There was no uh, time limit on the amount of assistance that you received from the federal government back in the 1990s prior to implementation of Perora. But now with Perora, uh, this changes the entire complexion, the entire philosophy of how we deliver uh, assistance to the poor. Uh, I'm outlining here the major explicitly stated purposes of uh, TANF legislation in 1996. So you'll notice here that the first two purposes reflect the same philosophy that was in place prior to implementation of TANF, and that is to help uh, needy families and to reduce dependence. Right? We retained those, uh, those stated purposes from previous legislation, but then we added a, diff a couple of different components here, and that's in the way of a family structure. There's a concern about uh, births outside of marriage, and so the third a stated purpose is to reduce uh, the incidence of out of wedlock births, right? And there's also a concern about uh, the lack of two parent families and such. And so there's a concern about family structure, which is reflected in the fourth and last stated purpose of, of forming and maintaining two parent families. So note that 
This program is now no longer about just receiving assistance and promoting work, but it's about family structure. Right? Our, our welfare system is really uh, concerned about uh, the fabric of the American family uh, as reflected in these uh, explicitly stated purposes. So I noted that this is a block grant, meaning that the federal government will make a lump sum payment to each state. That's what we mean by a block grant. And as a condition to receiving this uh, assistance from the, from the federal government, the states have to abide by certain conditions. Okay, that's what we mean by a block grant system. Uh, and so those conditions uh, are basic rules that the states must follow. So uh, just the basic point about this slide is about uh, states don't necessarily have to set, spend their block grant funding on poor families. They can spend on non-poor families uh, as long as uh, it's, uh, it's in line with effectuating the, the third and fourth stated purposes of the legislation. That is, uh, in terms of promoting two-parent families and reducing uh, out-of-wedlock births. Uh, so in the way of this block grant that attaches certain conditions to states uh, in terms of receiving the federal dollars, uh, there are some basic eligibility rules that the states must abide by. There are some work requirements and time limits, uh, most importantly. And then there are some maintenance of effort rules. There are other requirements as well that the federal government will impose on state governments having to do with data and reporting requirements that I don't list here uh, as being uh, irrelevant for our purposes. All right, so we'll just talk uh, very briefly about these major conditions. So first, in terms of eligibility. Uh, the basic eligibility rule uh, for TANF is that you must have a minor child. To, so the federal legislation says that as a condition of receiving uh, federal dollars, the states must make sure that all recipients uh, do in fact have a minor child in their home. Uh, the recipients must assign any sort of uh, rights to child support payments. If they're receiving child support payments, they have to assign the rights over to the, to the state governments. And so uh, historically, uh, this was as a way to, to fund the system that it wouldn't be so uh, entirely, the, the onus wouldn't be entirely on taxpayers, but that the putative fathers, right, the alleged fathers would have uh, an obligation uh, to fund uh, the welfare system. And then there are some rules that apply to young moms. So teen moms, if you're under age 18 and, you, uh, and you're trying to receive assistance uh, based on a minor child, so you have to live with a supervising adult, and you also have to uh, go to school. Yeah, once your child reaches three months of age, uh, as a young mom, you have, to, you have to make sure you're attending school. There are some classes of uh, persons who are categorically, in other words, on the basis of falling into a certain category, they're categorically ineligible for receiving assistance, and that's non-citizens uh, are not eligible for, uh, for welfare or uh, TANF assistance or federal dollars. And then, of course, uh, there are certain classes of uh, uh, persons with felony backgrounds, so drug-related uh, felony uh, persons with felony backgrounds, they're categorically ineligible to receive uh, welfare assistance. This is in the second class of conditions that I, I was alluding to before. There are certain work requirements, right? So the federal government says as a condition to receiving this block grant, uh, states must make sure that their recipients are engaged in, in some, uh, some accreditable work activity within 24 months of receiving uh, federal dollars. Right? This is called the work trigger rule. Uh, some states choose to be more strict than 24 months. So some states say, well, uh, they, they're allowed to be more strict. They can say, well, within 18 months of receiving TANF dollars, uh, you, have to, you have to find some sort of uh, established work activity. Uh, Illinois has a 24-month work trigger. And so the majority of states uh, have the more lenient work trigger, but note that states can be more strict in setting this work trigger. There are some uh, work participation rates at the state level, meaning that states must make sure a certain percentage of their caseload are working that is 50% of all families must be working uh, in terms of their caseload. Uh, just a, a brief historical note, there was something called this caseload reduction credit, where the more effective states were in reducing their caseloads, their uh, uh, work participation rates, their state work uh, participation rates would concomitantly, they would go down. So for example, if the state reduced their caseload by 10%, their minimum work participation rate would also go down by 10%. So this was kind of uh, a rule without any teeth. Right? So states were so effective at reducing their caseloads initially that they really didn't have to meet work requirements uh, in the initial years of the program. But note that uh, in the reauthorization of TANF uh, in later years, we no longer have this caseload uh, reduction credit. Uh, I had noted before that uh, in terms of the work trigger rule that uh, recipients must find work within 24 months. That's what the work trigger uh, rule says. And so the federal government uh, will list uh, 12 different activities that counts, uh, 12 different activities that count as work, and they're listed in order of priority from unsubsidized 
uh, unsubsidized private employment at the highest level of priority, all the way down to secondary school attendance. This is a listing of all the activities that may be counted as work, is what I'm noting here. And then finally, there is the requirement that uh, families, uh, all families, have to work at least 30 hours. If you have a two-parent, if there's a two-parent family receiving welfare assistance, they have to work 35 hours. So some of the major rules uh, that I'm listing here. Now, there are time limits as well. So in, uh, as, uh, in terms of receiving welfare assistance, there's a maximum five-year lifetime limit. Right? So the states can provide uh, TANF dollars or federal dollars to recipients for maximum five years. Uh, there's a 20% exemption, meaning that uh, they can exempt 20% of their caseload from this maximum five-year time limit. And this is typically for hardship reasons, uh, most notably in the way of uh, domestic violence victims. Uh, they can uh, receive assistance for more than uh, five years. If the states want to go over five years, they can't use federal dollars to do that. They have to use their own funds uh, uh, to provide assistance for the maximum allowable time. And then just a quick note on the maintenance of effort rules. This is just basically saying that states uh, can't just sit back and use federal dollars alone. They have to spend uh, state dollars as well. So there was a certain percentage that was uh, outlined in the legislation initially. 75% uh, was the initial benchmark. Uh, just a quick note about the TANF benefit level. So I'm contrasting here with social insurance. So unlike Social Security, uh, so TANF benefit levels aren't automatically adjusted for inflation. There's no COLA that attaches uh, to our welfare benefits and that's sort of commonsensical, right? That's to make sure that we were not uh, incentivizing dependency. We want to get people off the welfare rolls is how the legislation was passed. Uh, and so you'll note that there's only a handful of states that have increased their benefit levels over the years uh, to keep pace with uh, uh, changes in the cost of living. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm noting here the different ways in which uh, states actually spend their TANF dollars. Uh, and so you'll note that most TANF uh, federal dollars are spent on cash assistance, right? So uh, the average benefit level for family of three differs from state to state, but it's typically in the range of $300 to $400. So most states are spending their federal dollars on cash assistance uh, for poor families. And then you'll note that 18% of all federal dollars are being spent on child care programs. These are child care programs that the states are maintaining and then you'll note that uh, consistent with the overall purpose of TANF, they don't have to spend their dollars on poor families necessarily. So 10% of federal uh, funding is going towards uh, funding uh, uh, programs like homeless shelters and domestic violence uh, programs as well. All right, the last uh, section here is just a quick note about uh, characterizing all the different state TANF programs. So there are as many TANF programs as there are states in the US, right? So states uh, have the responsibility uh, in the end, uh, to administer the program as they see fit, subject to these conditions that are attached to receipt of the block grant. Uh, but uh, states, uh, because they have latitude, uh, we have a lot of different programs with different features. But if we were to look across the board and make a generalization about all the different state TANF programs, certainly I think you can make a case that there's a strong work first emphasis, regardless of whether or not families are actually self sufficient, that uh, they could leave the welfare rolls. And, uh, and maintain a standard of living. That's not really the issue, it seems, uh, if you look at the structure of all the different state programs. You can see it in the emphasis on the time limits. So there's a five-year, of course, maximum lifetime limit. Some states have gone to two-year time, time limit, saying that you can't receive TANF dollars for more than two years. Right? That reflects a work-first emphasis, I think. Uh, and then, of course, you can see it in the way of the disregards that have been implemented by different states, very generous disregards in certain states, California, a $225 disregard and 50% of remaining earnings. Florida, very generous. Ohio, very generous. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, our neighboring state, not so generous. And then uh, in Illinois, we have a 66% disregard on earned uh, income. So 66, two thirds of all your earnings are disregarded when calculating uh, your, your benefit, your uh, state, your Illinois benefit level. Uh, so I'm noting here some of the outcomes of TANF legislation over the years. So recall the major purpose. If, if we're assessing uh, the program uh, that is TANF uh, in terms of its ability to reduce the caseload, to reduce dependency, and certainly I think there's evidence uh, for the effectiveness of the program. We were very effective in reducing the TANF caseloads, as you can see throughout the years. Although in more recent years, the TANF caseloads are once again growing. But uh, we were, there's some evidence here that we were, in fact, effective in reducing dependency. If we're measuring the effectiveness of TANF 
in terms of promoting work, not only kicking people off the roles, but seeing to, uh, to what extent uh, do TANF recipients actually find work? Well, there's some evidence that a TANF has been effective. So employment rates among single moms receiving TANF assistance have gone up over the years slightly. So 71% in 1994 to 81% as of 2001. Uh, and we've maintained that rate uh, since 2001. If we're assessing the effectiveness of TANF in terms of poverty, so there's evidence that we've reduced poverty among single uh, moms receiving TANF assistance, 42% to 32% is what I'm showing in the slides. But where we haven't done a very good job, uh, where the numbers show a sort of weakness in terms of the effectiveness of the program is in terms of uh, people who leave TANF and making sure that uh, they're self-sufficient. So we haven't done a very good job of, of maintaining uh, the self-sufficiency of welfare uh, recipients and leavers. Uh, and you can see the evidence, 20% of people who leave uh, our, TANF, our state TANF programs actually come back on TANF assistance. And then, of course, most people who leave TANF, uh, their earnings are not at poverty, right? They're making less uh, than what poverty would dictate, uh, typically in minimum wage jobs and such. And so, uh, uh, so I think there's a, a clear case here that can be made that uh, we, we might have had some success in terms of reducing dependency and promoting work, but not so much in terms of self-sufficiency. Uh, and so this concludes uh, the week nine lecture on, uh, on social insurance and public assistance. And the next week, we'll dive into uh, our healthcare system and health reform. Uh, that's going to be the topic for week 10.